Hello, everybody. I am Patrick Darty, joined as always by Mr. Denny Carter. It is now, uh, what is it, Denny? I think we just finished week three. We're it going is. into week four. Uh, we're having some technical difficulties. Uh, we'd like to have those sorted out by week three, but uh, hey, let's, just, let's just say the the law narrator hit my uh, internet line. Yeah, you, right, as, as you said, you are world records levels of down bad, and I actually believe that. It's... Yeah, I, I am. I am sweating profusely. I am extremely, <laughs> extremely rattled. But I got to say, not as rattled as I was earlier when you and I were on the phone, and you suggested a certain uh, fantasy superstar <laughs> may be droppable now, and I was just wondering if you wanted to mention that to the people. In, yeah, in my ranting and raving about, uh, you know, variance, we're going to call it variance. A lot of people in my mentions are calling it luck, um, which, of course, is not <laughs> I heard that word in a while. Uh, and, probably makes uh, a lot more sense than our fancy word uh, variance. Yeah, no, but variance sounds better. It makes us sound smarter. It sounds it makes it sound like you're you're pushing the glasses up the bridge of your nose when you say it. But uh, is uh, Justin Jefferson? You know, so for one half of football, uh, you thought that okay, well, I just I I got him. I got Justin Jefferson in the draft, so I win the league. So because no one can compete with me if my guy's scoring forty fantasy points every single week. And he has 285 yards in the first half of the first game yeah. to Justin Jefferson. Right. So. And then after that, uh, nothing, uh, literally nothing. Uh, to Today, Tuesday, uh, Kevin O'Connell, the head coach of the Vikings, said that Justin Jefferson only had eight or nine snaps against the Lions in week three without, quote, some variation of a double team, meaning that teams are – saw what saw what they did to the Packers and said, no, we will not be doing that. Um, it has, you know, cascading effects across the whole Vikings offense, but man, does it, is it frustrating for a Jefferson drafter to look at those two box scores, miserable, miserable box scores after such a great week one. It's also frustrating because we have the Sean McVay acolyte in Minnesota and you would think he had heard of the concept of a double team. For Justin Jefferson before. This is the thing. You know, it's it's like the too high safety thing where, uh, okay, a double team. So Justin Jefferson is the first receiver to ever see a double team in the NFL. <laughs> that that's that's how I'm I that's what I am to believe from what Kevin kind of just like just like last year, it was like so the Chiefs are the first team to ever face a a, a, a too high safety look. This must be the case. No, it's not the case. These these things cannot be like team destroyers. No. They, they, there there has to be a way to overcome this. I would think that Justin Jefferson's raw talent would be enough to overcome a double team, but I'm wrong. I'm wrong about that. Well, you would think if Mike Zimmer knew how to overcome a double team, that Kevin O'Connell would know how to overcome a double team because Mike Zimmer didn't seem to have a bunch of issues with it last year. So just something to follow. So yeah. What, so Justin Jefferson's being dropped across the board, Denny, um, yeah. because of your every, advice. Every format. Would you tell people to add him then if Justin Jefferson was dropped in your league? No, you add KJ Osborne. <laughs> no, we are really hoping Justin Jefferson will bounce back this week, just like Jamar Chase will bounce back. Just like man, you were talking about it was maybe the worst receiver week I've ever, 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 ever seen. There were not receiver uh, fantasy points. I mean, come on, man. Like, I know literally okay, Matt I'm, Collins, the only one. Yeah, uh, him and Greg Dortch. They're the only two good receivers in the, in the NFL. <laughs> they're the only two good ones left. Uh, yeah, it was trying to make like my fantasy all pro team for this week. It was seriously like looking at names like just no no one who even touched like a first or second round yeah. ADP was uh, producing this week. And this down is up, up is down. Yeah, the top receivers this week were Devontae Smith, Mac Collins, Marquise Brown, Russell Gage, oh, Zay God. Jones, Chris Olave, Amari Cooper, Romeo Dobbs, who we're going to talk about in a minute, Isaiah McKenzie. Just an absolutely crazy, crazy week. And we're going to get to a few of those players in a moment. But, Denny, I wanted to talk about Trevor Lawrence, and yeah. you wanted to talk about the Jaguars' offensive approach. Trevor Lawrence led my column on Monday just as, you know, he's kind of – I, I try to be tempered, like in my praise. Where it, he, it's not like he's making the leap to superstardom right this right. second. It's not like he's becoming an every week QB one. But I think they have proven that it was really just this environment that needed to rebuilt, be rebuilt, not necessarily his game. He's taking baby steps to kind of being the player we thought he was going to be. You're right now, 
It's kind of a meat and potatoes offense. It's very balanced. They're sixth in rush attempts. They're just trying. It's a very narrow target tree, which I think you're going to talk about. And yeah, just talk about maybe what Trevor Lawrence is doing well, what what Doug Peterson is doing with the offense, and maybe what it means for all fantasy football. Yeah. So you know, last year it was really hard. You couldn't even squint and see uh, how Trevor Lawrence was going to make it basically no. in the NFL because every metric was awful, was as bad as you could imagine. It was the same way for 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 Zach uh, Wilson whose name is temporarily escaped me, but this year, so through three weeks, uh, Trevor Lawrence has the second highest completion rate over expected uh, trailing only Geno Smith, uh, strangely enough. Uh, and, uh, you know, he has the highest, let's see, Trevor Lawrence had the highest success rate of any quarterback in week three against the chargers. It, it's, it seems to be coming together in a way that I think is sustainable for this Jags offense. And, and here's the thing. Unlike Urban Meyer, who uh, just insisted on establishing the run on the early downs, especially on first and 10, the Jags are actually, and they got a, they got away from this a little bit in week three, I have to say, but they are making a concerted effort to pass more on first down, which gives your, you put your quarterback in a more favorable situation, right? Where the defense doesn't know that you're going to pass. This is the thing, you know, teams put, put quarterbacks in terrible spots, especially young quarterbacks. They're not doing that. Doug Peterson's not doing that with Trevor Lawrence, and we thank him. Yeah, it's been run focused, but not. But it's also been EPA focused, like you said, where they're not just running more for the sake of it. They're trying to just yeah. run smart. And they said they kind of got away with that, away from that on Sunday in Week Three, because they don't seem like they're a confident enough team yet to just like be pedal to the metal. And like right. they got a lead on the, the Chargers, they definitely kind of went to like salt the game away mode. Like they we're did. not going to blow this game mode, and they didn't. They, and they, and hey, you know what? That works. It, they they were in a a spot where I think they just wanted to get out of there with the win. You can't blame them too much. But uh, talking about the target tree now, you have three guys running all the routes. Okay, so this is good for fantasy. This is uh, at least at least somewhat predictable. I want to say highly predictable, but that's a little much. Somewhat predictable for fantasy because you have Zay Jones, Christian Kirk, and Marvin Jones running every single route. Okay. <laughs> Um, and, and, and so we know where the ball is going, it's primarily going to Christian Kirk and Zay Jones, honestly. And Zay Jones had a great game uh, against the chargers. I think 10 catches for 85 yards and a touchdown. I mean, I looked at the box score this morning and I said, what, what is that? And, uh, don't want to talk he, about it. Basically he will be featured in the waiver wire article on NBC sports edge tomorrow. Oh my gosh. Uh, look. Uh, the coaches love him. Okay, uh, if, if there was a, if there was a metric for coach love, he, Zay Jones would be off the chart. Yeah, he knocks it out of the park. Uh, so, so the, this offense uh, is fun for fantasy. It's good for fantasy because we know where the ball is going, and Trevor Lawrence is delivering it in, in an efficient way. He's, and just the next two steps for Trevor Lawrence, maybe run a little bit more. Not that I think it was always kind of oversold. Like he, no one, not that anyone really tried to sell him as a dual threat. I was like, oh, here's a guy who'll run, you know, and <laughs> that was always a bit unrealistic, but yeah. only eight carries for 22 yards. He can definitely do better than that through three games. And so far, he only has four completions of 20 plus yards. They're not really cutting it loose down the field. I think they've only attempted 12 or 13, but those are like the two next areas for improvement. He's already got his, just in terms of like traditional efficiency, his completion percentage is up from 59.6% as a rookie to 69.3%. I, like Urban Meyer, just should be ashamed of himself and don't really know how he right. sleeps at night. Well, uh, yeah, it would have been, it, yeah. I mean, it would have been helpful for Urban Meyer to learn the names of players, to get on the get on the plane after a game, yeah, would have been, uh, would have been know, nice to, to to actually engage in the job, but he did not. So Trevor Lawrence is an interesting guy, but he's not like a priority ad or anything this week. Romeo Dobbs of the Green Bay Packers is looking like a priority ad. And mm -hmm. the Packers you know, have been talking about the need for someone to step up and you know, not so subtly hinting. They really, really, really want it to be Romeo Dobbs. That happened on Sunday. Eight catches, I believe 72 or 73 yards. I believe it was you, Denny, in our blurb. You said he was a few shoestring tackles away from going well beyond yeah. 100 yards. And does this look maybe sustainable for Romeo Dobbs? Christian Watson didn't play week three. What What is it? Should we, how much should we rushing out to spend on the waiver wire? What is kind of the short and long-term outlook for Romeo Dobbs? I think he, I mean, he showed that he is the best receiver that Aaron Rodgers has 
Um, he, he drew eight targets on 34 routes, which is a, which is a nice, um, you know, a, a solid percentage there. He was a mainstay in two receiver sets for the Packers. Uh, I think importantly, the Packers design plays to get the ball to Dobbs early in the game, including his short touchdown in the first quarter. Um, they, they definitely stopped doing that at some point. I don't know if the Bucks made a defensive adjustment, but there was a concerted effort. And Aaron Rodgers said after the game, we had plays, uh, you know, we had, we did, we practiced plays in practice that, that were designed for Dobbs. We wanted to get him involved early. He had 34 yards on three catches and a touchdown in the first drive of the game against Tampa. So I, I think it, it, it's all looking up for him as a potential wide receiver one. I don't think anybody's going to run away with a 25% target share here uh, in this offense, but he could, he could easily be a high end wide receiver three, low end two going forward. If he's able to continue with these, with this full complement of snaps and routes. Top 36 does seem like a realistic season long outcome for Romeo Dobbs. Probably not, like in the top 30, probably won't really push for wide receiver two. Cause I mean, it is going to remain a deep group. It is going to remain kind of a sprawling group. And like you said, they might've already adjusted on him yesterday. He's going to have to learn to adjust to the adjustments, but especially this week where it's not a loaded group at receiver. If you just need yeah. like immediate help at receiver right now, I mean, what well, Denny, it's a group highlighted, at least in terms of player under players who are under 50% rostered. It's like Russell Gage, Michael Gallup, Traylon Burks, Devonte Parker, Isaiah McKenzie, not, it's not a difference making group this week at receiver. And I, I Romeo Dobbs, I think you would call him the most compelling receiver ad of, of week four, correct? Yeah, I, I think so. I think people will look at Mac Mac Hollins, and I get that because he had a big game. I mean, Mac Hollins had a 60 yard catch and a 48 yard catch. So it's hard to it's hard to uh say, oh, take Dobbs over the guy making long catches. I get that. But I, I don't think Hollins' role is as stable uh and has as much potential going forward as Hollins does in that Vegas offense. Well, yeah, let's just talk about Matt Collins. Where I said we, I kind of wanted to talk about the quote-unquote gross ads today. Like, no one really wants to add Zay Jones, the X Raider. No one really wants to add Matt Collins, the current Raider. But, you know, we don't decide who has value. Like, it just it happens. It happens, like, yeah. like Someone catches the coach's fancy. Matt Collins is clearly logged on in Josh McDaniel's offense. And maybe some of this is fluky, you know, a 60-yard catch. Yesterday, that's not going to happen every week, but I believe he's 14th in yards through three weeks. Right. And just, is there anything real here with Mac? I mean, of course, there's something real. He's got 250 yards almost, but how real is Mac Collins looking? And do we need to take our medicine and add him off the waiver wire? <laughs> I, he should be added, I think, in like 12 team leagues where you have multiple flex spots. I, I, I would get that. You know, Hunter Renfro was out this week. That opened up. Uh, a, a good, you know, you know, 18% target share, 16% target share that needed to go somewhere. And it all went to Hollins, apparently, who is the, the leading receiver for the Raiders after three weeks. Ooh, I kept in my dynasty league for about seven years. You should have kept, you should have held on for that eighth year. It's proving like there's no such thing as a sunk cost. Do you never, ever, until a player formally announces their retirement, you keep them in dynasty. Yeah. No cost has ever been sunk. I think no. is, that, is what you're saying. <laughs> no. uh, you, you know, <laughs> I, I don't I don't think that he's worth pursuing aggressively on the waiver wire. Um, and but it'll be hard for for fantasy managers to look at that stat line from yesterday, 150 plus yards and a touchdown and say, no, I, I don't want that guy like and, and I, I do. I do understand that. But I would be, uh, you know, careful on that. Listen, including yesterday, including against the Titans, Mac Hollins has been targeted on just 14 percent of his pass routes. This season, that's very low. And these two games have come as Devontae Adams has been contained. And maybe Josh McDaniels is a fake sharp, but we know that I mean, there's going to be an adjustment. There's going to be a come hell or high water. We are getting Devontae Adams the ball adjustment. And Matt Collins is going to be one of the big losers from that. And this also happened. Hunter Renfro did not play in week three with a concussion. And if anything, it's proving Matt Collins can be to different coaching staff in Vegas, but Maybe he can be you know, a good downfield role player like Zay Jones was last mm -hmm, year mm -hmm. um, or Nelson Aguilar was a few years ago. So maybe he's going to he won't fall off the face of the earth, but it's also hard to see like legitimate fantasy value uh, developing. Mac this, as I say about the guy who this is dominating the past. Yeah, I know. <laughs> you know, week nine. Yeah, I mean, I know 
you know, it was his eighth straight 100 yard game. I know it's 229 yards, the most by any receiver in the NFL this year, but I, right. I'm still not adding him. I know the Raiders just signed him to a six year extension worth $190 <laughs> million, but listen, you we got to be careful here. I mean, I know he looks like literally the complete package. <laughs> not adding him, not adding him. Uh, someone who fantasy managers like to think is the complete package, Denny, is Khalil Herbert in the yeah. Bears backfield, who has succeeded basically any time he's been given any amount of run well he did this last year david montgomery came back from injury and just immediately reassumed in every down roll but david montgomery's hurt again this year it is a new coaching staff it seems to be a totally different approach it seems to be one of the more run heavy approaches we've seen in the past 10 years it seems to be something of a road paving offensive line um but david montgomery has not been ruled out for week four So we don't know if we add Khalil Herbert, if we'll even be able to immediately get him in there as an RB2. But I just take us through the two different outlooks. So what are we using, spending on on Fab, on Khalil Herbert? Like what is the upside if David Montgomery doesn't play? But then if David Montgomery does play, can we still use Khalil Herbert in week four? Yeah, well, for for those who who, uh, are blissfully unaware, uh, Khalil Herbert went for 157 rushing yards, two touchdowns, and caught two balls yesterday against the Texans. And – Really, really quite the quite the day for Herbert. And here's the thing. Like you mentioned, Pat, uh, he's good and he might be really good. Um, this year, he he is leading all NFL running backs in yards after contact per rush. Only Nick Chubb has more runs of more than 10 yards than Khalil Herbert. And wow. Herbert and, and Herbert has 30 fewer carries than Chubb. So, you know, he was uh, Herbert was extraordinarily productive as a college back at Virginia tech is coming to the NFL has continued that every time he's been given a chance, he, he very likely is the best running back skill wise and production wise in the Chicago backfield. That doesn't matter so much because the bears love David Montgomery so much more than you really somehow. (laughs) And, uh, um, but we, we, we do, we, we do have to be careful with, you know, blowing our entire free agent budget on Herbert because it doesn't seem like, the Montgomery injury is catastrophic. And thank, thankfully, you know, we obviously we don't want that, but it looks like Montgomery has a chance to play this week. If he sits for one week, then he'll come back to that starting role in the following week. I don't think that there's any scenario where Herbert just, just takes over this uh, backfield naturally. If we get word on Tuesday that Herbert, or excuse me, that Montgomery will miss at least one game. It is worth like upping the bid then because you might think it's only one game, but I mean, even stealing one week, would be huge. Like if Khalil Herbert comes in and helps you like steal a victory, that's worth a pretty big fab investment, even if it's only one week. But yeah. well, I don't think we're going to know Montgomery's status on Tuesday. Um, we know he's not going on injured reserve. He's not going to miss four games. He could miss zero games. And yet, and we also know that even though this is a new coaching staff, they still seem very committed to David, who, David Montgomery, who has been quite good also. He yeah, hasn't yeah. been as good as Khalil Herbert. But he has been good. This has been a road paving Bears line, actually. They kind of made the Packers look silly. It is yeah. good. And and no one has a lower pass rate over expected than the no. Bears by a mile. By a yeah. mile. So well, we know uh, the Bears' offensive approach. Uh, do we know the Tampa Bay Buccaneers' offensive <laughs> approach? Because oh, I feel like we don't. And it's understandable. Every receiver is hurt. The offensive line is banged up. It's hard for them to pivot to the run because Leonard Fournette is banged up and he's also Leonard Fournette. Uh, just what is the state of this Bucks offense? We know that they're getting Mike Evans back for week four, I believe against the Chiefs. Uh, so we, they at least have that coming. Chris Godwin, though, didn't get any practice reps last week. He seems probably on the wrong side of questionable. Just, what is the state? I, I don't even know what the question is. Just yeah. talk, talk to me about the Tampa Bay Buccaneers offense, Denny. Uh, when I say Bucks offense, what comes to mind? Uh, check down. <laughs> Check down comes to mind. And and, and that's what happened. Look, I, I covered the Bucks Packers game. You forced me to watch a football game, so I did. And uh and that's all Brady did. Uh it was check down to Fournette, it was to Russell Gage, it was to Cole Beasley, who saw four targets in limited action. Uh so there, there really nothing else going on. He doesn't even look Brady doesn't even look to the outside. Okay. Yeah. And 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 as someone who rostered Scotty Miller in some DFS contest, Ooh, I'm triggered man. by that. OK, yeah. uh, so but, that yeah, is on you, by the way. Yeah, every, I'll, I will go down with with Scotty Miller. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, look, it, every everything is short. Um, uh, Next Gen Stats has this uh, great 
uh, metric for, for measuring aggressiveness, a quarterback's aggressiveness, as you may expect, uh, Tom Brady is near the bottom of uh, that metric. And, you know, we'll, we'll probably continue to be that way behind an offensive line that's been marred by injury. Okay. This is, this is not the same offensive line that allowed Brady to stand back there and just pepper his great pass catchers. You know, when he had Gronk, he had Evans, Godwin, Antonio Brown, he was able to do that behind this great line. He doesn't have those pass catchers and he doesn't have the line anymore. So I don't think Tom Brady can be started in 12 team leagues going forward. Well, he, not at least not for week four, although he is getting the great outside threat. Mike Evans back. Yeah. And I'll say the, the positive signs of Brady. It, so, you know, when Peyton Manning, his final season, when he went off the rails, the physical, physical decline was evident to Sorry. anyone with a pair of eyes. You turn on the game, you're like, wow, like this guy's done. <laughs> that, that's not the case with Tom Brady. Tom Brady still appears physically fine. He does. This isn't like an arm strength issue. It's not like even a mobility issue. For Tom Brady, it's just their surrounding talent issue. And at least a receiver, it will be coming in some form. At least, we hope. Um, are they on their third string left tackle? Maybe we can at least get them up to their second string left right. tackle. Um, right. And I do feel like this is the low point. And I, I'm not definitely not ready to say, like, drop Tom Brady, actually, or that he won't be a top 12 quarterback. It's a little hard. In his current form, he's not. But I, I do see there's room for improvement. I, I do see room from hope for hope just in that it's not physical with Tom Brady. Um, yeah. But I understand also your point of view. No, you're right. I, I just, I don't think that we're going to get, even if Evans come, when Evans comes back, when Godwin gets back, I don't think we're going to get the 2020 and 2021 Tom Brady because of the line issue. Um, you're looking at his, his yards per attempt. Um, he averaged almost eight yards per attempt in week one, which is nice five and a half in week two, six and a half in week three. I think we're going to see more of that five and a half and six and a half number going forward. And yeah, it's very 2020, 2021 Tom Brady is not coming back. That That is true. This with the offensive line. I mean, even when this line was healthy, it was still breaking in three new starters along the interior. Yes. And now it's not healthy. So that is a very, very fair point. Denny, someone that no one wants to talk about, like we're talking no one, is Jamal Williams. But especially because I believe he's over 50% rostered. Yeah. But DeAndre Swift is injured again. He has both an upper body injury and a lower body injury. Maybe like choose one region of the body at least to have hurt DeAndre Swift. And is so I, I, the way I phrase this question to you when we were discussing the show, if DeAndre Swift misses week four, does Jamal Williams clear the Jeff Wilson line? Mm-hmm. And to say if DeAndre Swift plays week four, like, what is even our level of trust in DeAndre Swift anymore? So on and so forth. I'm very sad. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, it stinks, this whole Swift thing. Because, you know, week one, just like with Jefferson, week one, you're like, oh, okay. Like, I got I got the RB1 overall, <laughs> DeAndre yeah. Swift. Not, not so much. I, I will say that, you know, Jamal Williams is not going to see, like, an uninterrupted three-down role here because Craig, Craig Reynolds is still a thing. He's still in there. He ran some routes against the, the uh, Vikings this week and, and will continue to do so. The thing is, though, coming into week three, Jamal Williams had a healthy lead in high value touches, meaning receptions and then touches inside the 10 yard line. Uh, we all know and Swift Swift managers know, Swift drafters know that Jamal Williams is the, the hammer goal line back and they prefer it that way and they want it that way. Um so yeah, I mean, he he should be treated as I think a very high end RB two. I'm trying to be conservative here, uh, but the, and and the, look at this this Lions offense is very fr- fantasy friendly because a it's fast paced, and b they have they have a soft schedule and they have another cake matchup this week against Seattle. Yeah, to to every what's I was going to make a horrible pun to every Jamal Williams ca- ca- hammer. The goal line plane is a nail, something like that. Uh, it is. That, that makes sense. Guy, guy likes <laughs> touchdowns is what I'm trying to say. He does. He scores touchdowns. He's a touchdown scorer. You can't take that away from him. It is Craig Reynolds, though, not going away. Like you said, Jamal Williams, too, is also, I thought, very physically diminished last year. He's looking a little rejuvenated this year. But I don't know if he clears the Jeff Wilson line for me. I think Jeff Wilson's probably a better pure runner oh. and a better designed rushing attack. But it it is going to be really close. And I haven't done my initial week four rankings yet. And I guess I wouldn't be shocked if circumstance dictates 
then I have to have Jamal Williams over Jeff Wilson. Because you want to talk about an offense uh, not running hot right now. Yeah. The San Francisco 49ers. Yeah, um, down so we're not, extremely bad. Down extremely bad. Uh, the Vikings will be down bad if Dalvin Cook does not play in London in week four against the New Orleans Saints. They're claiming he's going to play with a harness on his shoulder. This is not something he does every year. He injures his shoulder. He comes back with a harness. He did so last year, and his first game with the harness, he had a 205-yard game against the Steelers. That was after he missed one game, though. They're optimistic he's not going to miss this game. I guess the Steelers' run defense that had gone 20 games without allowing an individual 100-yard rusher has now allowed two in the first three weeks yeah. to Cordero Patterson and then Christian McCaffrey. But what's the outlook in the, the Vikings' backfield right now? And I mean, if, if Dalvin Cook doesn't play, then, I mean, how how crazy are we getting with Alexander Madison? Uh, pretty crazy, I think. Uh, I mean, and and obviously it would be a one-week thing probably, but I I don't know what, you know, what you have to do to get people to pick up Alex, Alexander Madison. We could have and, one good spot start ever. That would help. Right. Well, it, <laughs> It's been in it's been in, in suspect circumstances. Okay, he's been game scripted out of, of out of a lot because he's not because he's not necessarily the locked in pass catching guy. Now he had a good pass catching role against Detroit after uh, after Cook went out, but you know I think that uh, you know in the past he has had that taken away from him. So um by the way by by almost every metric alexander madison is a more efficient rusher than oh, Dalvin Cook. so uh I, I all i'm saying is that the vikings may want to know vikings if you're listening you didn't need you know you you you're, you're good you're good with uh alexander madison you swear to god he's not going to chase edmonds us if dalvin cook you know the classic uh, well it finally is getting all the touches and it's 28 touches for 80 yards and zero touchdowns do you swear that's not going to happen? <laughs> look, 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 look. I don't know what you're talking about. Chase Edmonds has done well every time oh he's gotten my gosh. A, a, a decent workload. It's true. I, I cited that stat in August. Every time he's got seen like over 13 touches, he's done quite well. So I I I can't swear uh, because I, I you know it's against my religion. But I but I do <laughs> I do think I do think Madison would be a locked in. Uh, top 15 option if if Dalvin Cook is out and so don't don't go nuts but you you should try to roster him just in case on on Saturday or Sunday they say you know what we're gonna rest Dalvin for one one game and yeah I, the, I was kind of kidding on Madison who he had a reputation for first year or two in the league he had a few like real plug and play explosive spots he kind of face planted then last year he had a really good start against the Seahawks had a really good start against the Lions and yeah if, if we talk about plug and play RB twos, usually when like a, someone like Dalvin cook misses a game, Madison really does look like maybe a plug and play RB one. Yeah. If, and we'll get an early sign on Dalvin cook. I mean, his team's going to be flying to London. So if, if he takes the transcontinental flight, he's probably playing. If he doesn't, of course he's not playing, but if they fly him to London, it's not going to be to be part of the seven man inactives. Yeah. Madison is available in 45% of leagues. And I believe, in my heart of hearts, that the queen would have wanted you to pick up Alexander Madison. <laughs> it, was, it was the last thing she wanted, actually. Yeah. And she threw a corgi at her assistant who did not <laughs> add Alexander Madison. And it was, really, it was really quite a shameful episode, actually, for such a, a lovely, stately woman. So, it, it, uh, it was. And, and the media won't talk about it for some reason. They won't talk about it. But fantasy football brings out the worst yeah. in a lot of us. The worst in a lot of us, Denny, is unwavering belief in Ramondre Stevenson <laughs> and just then no matter what it's going to be Ramondre week it's finally happening it's going yep. to be Ramondre Ste- is it going to finally be Ramondre Stevenson this week now that Mac Jones's ankle injury seems likely to keep yeah. him out for several games and the Patriots are have no choice but to lean on this running game all right look look it it, it might actually be Ramondre season finally this this time it counts uh Stevenson against the Ravens this week or in week three led the Led the Patriots backfield with 12 carries, 73 rushing yards, four receptions, and 28 receiving yards. All of that <laughs> led Damian Harris. Okay, uh, they were rotating drives early in the game against against Baltimore, but Stevenson sort of took over later in the game um, because because he he's the main uh, running back in uh, two minute the two minute offense. 
Um, and when the Patriots get down and they have to step on the gas, like they're not put, they did not, at least in week three, they did not put Damian Harrison in those situations. They kept Stevenson in. So that rotation, that drive rotation that they've had for much of the season vanished. I think that's an, that's an important uh, situation here. Very, very important. And this time it's going to count. One of these times it's going to count with Ramondre Stevenson. And when it does, let's just say leagues will be won. Leagues yeah. will be won. I, well, you know, without Mac Jones, though, I do I do think that actually it's it, – that's a that's a bummer. If if Stevenson gets to take over with Brian Hoyer under center yeah. now, um, man, that that's tough. I, I guess you know the one thing is Hoyer does have a history of checking down to running backs. If Stevenson might just be able to get by on pure target volume, but projecting target volume for a running back who has well, I was going to say who's never done it, but he actually does command targets. So as I'm talking about it, I'm convincing myself that oh, it man. still can be Ramadre Sisson. Brian Hoyer has been washed since like at oh. least four presidential administrations. Ago. I literally, I actually had to do a depth chart check to make sure that I hadn't hallucinated uh, the <laughs> other day and or on Sunday, because I was like, there's, there's no way that I heard that Brian Hoyer is still the backup in New England. It has to be that zappy kid. No, it's no. Bailey zappy. No. Yep. It's Brian. Hoyer. It's um, Brian Hoyer has been the backup for 20 years. Yeah. It's nuts. Maybe by the end of the week, he'll be Cam Newton. No, that, that'll give the folks something to talk oh, about. God, please. Uh, no. Speaking of things to talk about, we're running out of time. There's two more topics. There's one I wanted to touch on and one you wanted to touch on. You wanted to touch on this. This is all you said, uh, the conk daddy. Um, <laughs> So what do we, tell people, tell the yeah. folks who the conk daddy is and what thoughts we are sharing on him. I mean, it sounds, it sounds dirty. It's not dirty. It's uh Tyler Conklin. The, the, uh, right the that's just what he's called. <laughs> Wait, this are you what making, he's called. You, you, yeah, you can discriminate. It's what he's called. That's what you're, right. you're making fun of his name. I yeah. don't, honestly, I, I don't do that personally. No, it's ridiculous. Uh, look, he's available in 80% of leagues. And here's the thing, Pat Conklin, after three weeks leads all tight ends in the <laughs> NFL in pass routes. He's fifth in target. Are you serious? <laughs> yes. He's, he's seventh in tight end yardage. Okay. Look, it's all volume based. This is a Jets offense that runs 1 million plays per game and passes on 99% of them. So I, so I get why this is happening. Tyler Conklin is still, as he has always been, extremely inefficient. Okay. Has one of the most atrocious yards per route run you could ever imagine. <laughs> I'll, I'll detail it in my column. Not good. It doesn't matter. He's out there running a lot of routes. Now, the thing is, Zach yeah. Wilson is coming back. They typically slow down the offense. They typically lean a little heavier on the run. That could strip Conklin of everything that we've kind of banked on. So I don't I don't want to say, oh, you got to get him. But, you know, if Flacco stays under center for one more week, you could have a nice streamer. Yeah, Flacco's attempts have been 59, 44, and 52. I mean... I would set the over under for Zach Wilson attempts probably at 34 and a half. And Maybe, yeah. I don't know if they really want that guy getting to 40. It's at least not in his first game back. No, way. it would also be weird to just totally run a completely different system, though. Um, to suddenly be a slow it down run first team, that's probably not going to happen. So, hopefully, some of the volume remains, but there's going to be a lot of theories tested when Zach Wilson seemingly this week comes back and. Because there have been a lot of uh, kind of unsustainable parties going on here. Yes. Um, in this Jets offense. But. Yeah, right. It, it, it really does. Uh, you know, if they do slow down the pace and, and lean more toward the run, it affects Conklin. The the running backs who have seen tons of target volume, it affects uh, Garrett Wilson. Every Everybody gets a uh, gets a knock. So please just maybe consider doing this with Zach Wilson, too, even though we know he's not even close to ready. Uh, to pass 40 to 45 times a game. Yeah. Yeah. The last player I want to talk about is I, I challenged you to come up with a positive DJ Moore stat yeah. because I need something. I, I got us. I, I got, I need something if I'm going to keep starting him, Denny. I, I, Eight catches in three games. I mean, I need I, something. I had my interns look very strongly into it and they found nothing. His yards per route run is way down. It, 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 even down from like, like past ugly stretches of his, of his career with, with no, with no quarterback, his targets per route run rate was 25% last year. Very strong. We like 25%. We don't like 15%, which is where it's at now. Here's the frustrating thing is that, 
Ben McAdoo, the Panthers offense coordinator, is actually trying to put Baker Mayfield and this Carolina offense in a good position. They have one of the highest first round for I'm sorry, first down pass rates in the league. He's trying. He can't because Baker Mayfield is just awful on every level. He's he's bad. They have they have no other option right now. No, no. And and so I just I don't see I don't see it turning around for Baker Mayfield. I I I'm sorry for uh, for DJ Moore. Uh, there's nothing there's nothing else to add. Like it's not like he's being limited with with routes, uh, you know, with snaps. Like he's out there. They're just not throwing the ball to him. And when they do, it's uncatchable. He's he's among the league leaders in uncatchable balls. Of course. Yeah, and I do I truly think this is on Baker Mayfield, by the way, not Ben McAdoo. Ben McAdoo was, was a yeah. very low worthy hire when they made it, but he was actually a decent play caller. With the New York Giants, he was just dealing with end stage Eli Manning, and it seems to be a totally fine, inoffensive NFL play caller. But Baker Mayfield is still playing like he only has one shoulder, uh, like he did. Like we thought maybe the horrible 2021 struggles were because he was playing with a torn left labrum, and it just doesn't look like that so far. And yeah, and by the way, they're moving DJ Moore around the lineup. He he's lining up in the slot 25 percent of the time. Uh, you know, they're not just like putting him out on an island there. I think they're, they're trying. It's just, they, it's just not working. His de- listen, his yards per route run is under one. Uh, yeah, man, man, oh man. Um, I lied when I said it was the last question. Who, who's the kicker stream of the week? Yeah. <laughs> Thank who's you the, for asking. Who's the kicker stream of the week? Uh, I'm glad you asked. Uh, and we're looking for it right now. Oh, it's Austin Siebert, who is a guy who kicks for the Lions. All right. He should be roster. He should be over 50% roster. He shouldn't be streamable. Oh, he needs my. To be rostered. You, you, over 50%? He needs to be rostered. So, People uh... would need to learn his name first before they roster him. <laughs> uh, they're playing in Seattle. You're starting your Lions. Just roll out your Lions. The, the Seahawks can't stop anybody on the ground. They can't stop anybody through the air. The process, the process, the process. We want Siebert this week. Trust the process. I trusted the process that uh, I would come home from picking up my daughter from school and my internet would work, and then it didn't. Um, so look where well, look where the analytics got me. Uh, look, we're we're hoping that the internet reaches Missouri eventually. No, come <laughs> on, man. Good God. <laughs> well, Good God. As a low, as low. as an elite, as an elite East Coaster, <laughs> I, I, I apologize. As you should, um, and we apologize that this show is over. It was a good show. But we'll be back later this week. Please check out Denny's column on the site, Waiver Wired. Check out my column, The Sunday Aftermath, a breakdown of all of week three's biggest storylines. Rankings coming later in the week. Preview show coming later in the week. Tuesday, I'll be talking with Lawrence Jackson and Kyle Dvorak, looking at some rankings conundrums. So for Denny Carter, I'm Patrick Darty. We will catch you later. Hey, it's Matthew Berry from NBC Sports and Rotorworld.com. Just want to thank you so much for watching what you just watched, or at least – being too lazy to click out of it after the you know autoplay just kept it going. So either way, thank you so much for just letting it scroll by your screen. And now I'd like to ask you respectfully, 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 okay, respectfully, please subscribe to the NFL on NBC YouTube channel for the latest NFL news, fantasy headlines from Rotor World, and betting analysis from NBC Sports Edge.